How should we view Alzheimer's through an evolutionary lens? Great question for an amazing panel at the Functional Forum in San Francisco. Dr. Bredesen, you know, what's really cool with the Functional Forum is that it's Tuesday lunchtime in Australia and people are watching and sending in questions. So welcome everyone who it's Tuesday. Um, Dr. Bredesen, someone uh, has asked from Australia, they, they watch your grand rounds as well. And they were asking what your thoughts were about uh, Alzheimer's in the context of this evolutionary medicine that we've been talking about today. Is there any uh, understanding of Alzheimer's in that context? Absolutely. I think. Uh, in multiple ways to think about evolutionary medicine. One of the things we just published recently was a new insight into what APOE actually does. And as you know, uh, some people have called APOE the God gene because it was involved with our evolution. It was involved with our coming down out of the trees, becoming hominids uh, uh, from simians. Uh, and, it, and it turns out to have effects, as we've heard, for uh, carrying lipid, for binding to multiple receptors. Now, if you've just seen, actually, it just came out in cell, it's also turning out to be important for invasion and metastasis of tumors, and, and of course, cardiovascular disease, and of course, it's the most important genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. And what we found is that it actually is, surprisingly, a, a transcription factor. So it actually enters the nucleus. We found that it, that it binds to the promoters of 1,700 different genes, and it literally changes the programmatics of the cell, changing, again, a little bit like what we heard about with thyroid. So you're changing from a state in which uh, SIR2 and SIRT1 is dominant, in which that is a, it's a metabolic state and it is a non-inflammatory state, more toward an NF-kappa B dominated state. And these two are actually mutually uh, uh, antagonistic. So you're now changing the state of the cell toward more of an NF-kappa B-like cell. And of course, so part of, part of our getting Alzheimer's disease, uh, it's such a common problem now. And if you look at the 318 million Americans, 45 million of us will get this during our lifetimes if we don't do something about it. You're really talking for many people about a mismatch between evolution and between the way we are currently living, absolutely. And of course, that tells you a little bit about how to treat it. Chris, I know you see a lot of uh, very tough patients in your, your clinic. Do you see Alzheimer's and would you, do you have some concordance there with uh, Dr. Bredesen's thoughts? Uh, we don't treat a lot of Alzheimer's in the clinic, but we see earlier stage dementia and cognitive issues. And, um, you know, I, I would just equate, there's really no modern disease that I'm aware of that doesn't have this element of mismatch that, that, that at, at the core. You know, if you look at, uh, traditional populations, contemporary hunter-gatherers, they, you know, they died because of trauma or lack of emergency medical care, of high rates of infant mortality, and so their average lifespans were shorter for those reasons, but they didn't get chronic disease, typically. Chronic disease is actually a modern problem. Um, there, just, there just wasn't a lot of chronic disease in traditional populations, and people have argued that that's because they didn't live long enough to get it, but there have been anthropological studies that have found that when contemporary hunter-gatherer populations had access to even the most rudimentary emergency medical care, they lived lifespans that were equivalent largely to our modern lifespans, but the difference is they reached those ages without acquiring Alzheimer's disease and type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease uh, or any of these other modern problems. So, um, yeah, I would, I would argue that there is really no modern disease that isn't primarily driven by this mismatch. Akhil, you want to jump in there? Yeah, um, just to add um, to the NF-kappa uh, kappa B, there's some really fascinating research about the effect of spices on, that, uh, on activating that transcription factor. So, um, you know, that's a huge part of Ayurveda, and I'm sure everybody here knows about turmeric, but um, also, um, you know, a lot of other spices that are commonly used, like allspice, uh, clove, ginger, cinnamon, fenugreek, um, these have all been shown to promote uh, NF kappa B activity, and um, you know, speaking of Alzheimer's, India has one of the lowest rates, you know, in in the world, and I think part partly is maybe due to dietary factors and the use of spices and um, <clears throat> turmeric, and I think these are simple suggestions that we can give our patients because no matter what kind of diet somebody's following, they can incorporate spices. Um, spices are the second most nutrient dense type of food that's in that's out there after organ meats. Um, so in addition to nutrient density and antioxidant capacity, anti-inflammatory effects, and you know, positive gene modulation, um, spices also help digestion and they can help your food taste better. So I think there's really a win-win situation using spices. 
Thanks so much for watching, and for more great clips like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I've created a special free video just for you called Harnessing the Power of Community in Your Practice, and it'll give you a clinical model, practical tools that double as marketing, and strategies to develop a community of your peers. All you have to do is click on the link below.